Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, I want to talk about procedural workflows in Houdini, the Houdini engine, and Unity 2017 for game content. My name is Kenny Lammers, and I am a freelance technical artist these days. Uh, but you can find me on IndiePixel.com or GameTutor.com. I produce a lot of uh, training material and um, blog articles, you know, the usual internet stuff. So I've been working in the game industry now for just about 20 years. It's almost 20 years. I, I rounded it up a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if that makes it more cool or if it just makes me look old. <laughs> but I've been uh, working in the game industry for almost 20 years now and I've worked at Microsoft, Game Studios, Activision, and, and Surreal Software. Um, I've been using um, Houdini and Unity and Substance now for quite some time and have been following the evolution of proceduralism over the last, I don't know, I would say six, seven years, something like that. And I really started picking up Houdini uh, when I was back at Microsoft, um, you know, doing a lot of procedural track development, stuff like that. Um, and then from there, I decided to create GameTutor.com and it was quite successful. And what I did is I, you know, really started teaching the basics of, of Houdini and Houdini Engine and just how do you start to get into the world of generating procedural content for your games. And it, it went really well. So I definitely encourage you to check out GameTutor.com and IndiePixel.com. Uh, that's where you can find most of my stuff and see what I'm up to. Um, I worked on Call of Duty 3, Crackdown 2, Alan Wake, Connectimals, uh, Connect Star Wars, and a lot of others. My, my situation when I was working at Microsoft and Activision uh, was a little different. I was working in the central technology teams. And so instead of, you know, working on one game for the whole duration, like two, three years, you know, in the whole production, um, I would basically be the technical artist that would be dropped into teams, take care of a couple, you know, issues or some pipeline issues. I would also present, you know, new ideas for pipeline type of technologies, new software. I would give little demos and, you know, try to get the studios up to speed. Uh, do I did a lot of shader work um, on some of these games. Um, on Call of Duty 3, I actually... Uh, got the opportunities to start working with 3D scanning so and photogrammetry and stuff like that. So did a lot of that on, on that project. So my situation was a little different. I would, I would you know, be with a team for maybe like a month or two, and then I would go over to another team. You know, so you know, I've worked on a lot of games, but I, I did spend a large majority of my time on Call of Duty 3, and I did a lot on Crackdown 2 and Alan Wake and Connectables and Star Connect Star Wars, especially like Connect Star Wars. We did all the procedural tracks with Houdini and uh, really sped up the production process for us. Uh, we were working with, uh, it was Terminal Reality. Um, anyways, so that's a little bit about me, my background. Um, I'm currently, you know, working um, as IndiePixel, producing training content and, you know, doing a lot of client work and stuff like that. All right, so moving on. So what is proceduralism? If you're not familiar with proceduralism, even though we're starting to see it more and more these days, um, proceduralism, the actual definition, I always want, I wanted to do this for my presentation um, just because it's fun to you know, see what the actual definition is. Uh, so proceduralism is a belief in the importance of using agreed procedures, a rigid adherence to established procedures. It might not give you a lot of information about how you use proceduralism in games, but at the core of it, at the heart of proceduralism, it's it's a set of procedures. You agree to a set of procedures, and the output from those procedures is a prop, or it's a terrain, or it's a road, right? Or in, in this case, a guard tower, and a ladder, and uh, some barrels, and stuff like that. Everything you see here is all procedural. None of that was hand modeled or anything like that. It's all generated from nodes, and uh, it's all generated using the Houdini engine for Unity. All right, so that's proceduralism in a you know very high level standpoint. So what we're seeing today is um, an explosion of proceduralism in terms of you know textures with like substance uh, designer and substance painter, uh, terrain generation. There's tons of different types of uh, terrain generators out there nowadays, and they're starting to get quite advanced. And Houdini has uh, quite a nice suite of terrain tools um, inside of it, and really speeds up the process of generating large terrains. Um, you see it uh, for city generation. You know, anytime uh, you have a situation in the game where you have to generate a ton of content. A city is a great example because there are so many buildings and street signs and streets and, you know, 
garbage on the sidewalks and trees and then there's people and there's a ton of content that needs to be generated for all that stuff and having a team of artists just you know kind of work on that stuff for months and months and months is you know it's hard and it's expensive so what you can do is you can utilize houdini and the houdini engine to really reduce costs speed up production and uh, maintain the the visual quality uh, you can even use it in animation though it's still a little rough uh, i've seen lots of procedural animation out there and uh, it's still in its early phases but it's you know coming along and obviously shaders and materials uh, a lot of our shader editors are now node based and makes it a lot easier and a lot faster so my point is you know the, the proceduralism is really starting to get a foothold in the game industry and um, the houdini and the houdini engine itself is are really at the core of of all of this and it's a great segue into the next slide here because you know, I've done a little bit of web development in the past, and I always like the way that web developers explain the technologies that they use as a stack of technologies, right? And in the game industry, we just call them DCC packages, you know, digital content creation packages. So you use Maya or you use Photoshop, and, but you are using a stack. And so the current procedural stack, at least from my standpoint, my perspective, um, the current procedural stack is Houdini 16.5. Houdini Engine 2.0, Substance Designer, and Unity 3D. And I, I'm very biased towards Unity. I love Unity. Um, you can do this whole, you could replace this whole portion of the stack with Unreal. Um, and it would be pretty much the same. So uh, that's the procedural stack. And I really just wanted to put this slide in here because I really feel like this is a whole workflow right here. You know, you generate your, your or your, you author your digital assets inside of Houdini. You import them into the Houdini engine for Unity and then design procedural textures using Substance Designer. Now you can do it in, in Houdini as well. It's just that Substance Designer is so focused on textures itself, whereas Houdini is trying to do a lot of things. You know, they use it for the movie industry and, and also the game industry. And, you know, it's largely been used as an effects package, but more and more we're starting to use it for games. And so it, it does a lot of things where Substance itself is focused on textures and so the tools and the the nodes they're really focused on that and so it just speeds it up uh, but I just wanted to say that you can do it inside of Houdini it's just it's not as streamlined yet I know they're working on it but um, it's just still not as, as streamlined but the other advantages of Houdini far outweigh the fact that you know the texture creations inside of Houdini um, isn't as powerful as substance the modeling and the effects and just the amount of stuff you can do with Houdini is incredible Okay, so that's the procedural stack. All right, so moving on. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a few different workflows inside of Houdini Engine 2.0. So this is actually new. It's, it's in beta now. So um, what we have is a completely new version of the engine. It's been rewritten. It's a lot more organized. It's uh, more optimized. Um, it, it's actually way better than the original versions. And it takes time, you know, to evolve this stuff. And, you got to get people using it. So the Houdini engine itself. So what is the Houdini engine? The Houdini engine allows us to take our digital assets from Houdini and import them into Unity or Unreal or Maya um, or Max, or all those uh, 3D packages and stuff like that. And it, it's super powerful. And we're going to get a little bit more um, examples here in, a, in a, a little bit. But the Houdini engine allows us to fully, fully utilize that power inside of uh, Houdini inside of our game engines and the awesome part about it the one thing that really drew me to it initially because I I wasn't a programmer you know when I first started out in the game industry um, I was largely just an artist a character artist not just an artist but I was a character artist but um, you know and I slowly moved into technical art and then I started picking up programming and um, programming while I've done it before uh, the programming of procedural geometry system I've, I've programmed my own inside of inside of uh, Unity um, it just takes a lot of time to do that. It could be months to create something that is as powerful as, you know, a lot of the procedural systems, um, like, for example, Procore inside of Unity. Uh, I mean, that took years to make. Um, using Houdini and the Houdini engine, you don't have to be a programmer. You don't need to have a PhD in mathematics uh, to start building your own geometry tools um, or your own level layout tools. Uh, you just need to know how to use the nodes. And that, it does take time to do that, but you can actually get started really fast. I would say, you know, you could probably learn the basics in about two hours inside of Houdini to generate a really basic digital asset. 
but it really doesn't take that long. And then from there, you just kind of start building up your knowledge about what all the nodes do. And, you know, you learn about attributes and grouping and VEX and stuff like that. So um, you can get into this really quick. And that's why I really wanted to, to mention that. You don't have to be a programmer to do this. It's it, They took a very technical and a very uh, complex um, problem, right? And just made it really simple. We just used the nodes inside of Houdini to create our own digital assets. All right. So that's the Houdini engine. That's what it does. It allows us to import digital assets, procedural content into Unity and Unreal. All right. So let's take a couple, let's take a little break here and let's look at a few examples. So I built a, a nice little demo that kind of explores every feature of the Houdini engine, except for the painting portion that's still being worked on. But uh, let's, let me play the video here for you guys um, so you guys can see it. So that, in a nutshell, is what we can do with the Houdini engine uh, for Unity 2017 and for Unreal as well. Um, it allows us to take those our digital assets and import them into the engine, and we still have the procedural power. So we can go and change all of our models, and we can um, you know, add more you know, detail to it or you know, rough it up. There's just an unlimited amount of things you can do. It's really up to your imagination. So let's move forward then and go on to the next step, <coughs> excuse me. So where do we get the Houdini engine? All right, so first off, it's part of the 16, Houdini 16.5 installer. It's labeled as the beta package. So this is the new package. So the original version of the, or the current, I, would, I should say the current official version of the Houdini engine is still included with the installer for, of Houdini, but that's where you get it. So um, let me go up there. I had these guys ready here. So if you go up to Houdini, you can get the free learning edition called Houdini Apprentice. And you just download it and install it. And what's going to happen is when the installer runs, it's going to ask you if you want to install the packages for the Houdini engine for Unity or Unreal. And you just hit the little checkbox and continue. And what it does is it creates the Unity package. So um, I have it open here. So once it's installed in your program files and side effects software, you get the installation folder. Um, and then inside of there, you have the engine folder right here. So this is where you can go and get the Unity package. And it's actually recommended to just import the Houdini engine scripts.unity package and just pull that in um, into your current Unity project, and it'll go and install everything and get it all set up. So the new version of the Houdini engine will be in a folder called labeled beta. So I just wanted to mention that. So that's where you get all that stuff. And if if you, uh, you know, really enjoy the workflows, and, you know, I highly recommend it, I would then, you know, move up to Indie if your revenue is under $100,000. It's pretty cheap compared to the amount of stuff that you can do. Um, there are limits inside of the learning edition. So Moving up to Indie allows you to get the full effect of Houdini. So, you, you know, you have effects stuff and uh, you can do FBX imports and exports, um, render out higher res, stuff like that. And if you're at a studio, then you're probably going, you're going to want to get the Houdini core or Houdini effects. So uh, I would start with the free, you know, versions. Just get used to, if you haven't done this before, just get used to uh, using Houdini 
uh, using the apprentice version and then move on up from there. So let's move on to the next slide here. All right. So the full release is going to come out later this year. They're still working on a few features and uh, things are still going. They're still testing it with the uh, users and stuff like that. So uh, the, the older version still does work. So if you do are currently working on a project where you're using the Houdini engine, uh, all of your stuff will still work. But I highly recommend checking out the beta version because uh, it's so much better. Uh, you know, I've been using the Houdini engine for a couple years now, and uh, this version two is great. It's really, it's really coming along. So, um, again, the installation details, uh, just import the Unity package. It'll just save you a lot of headaches, um, and it'll, it'll install everything for you. So, um, th there's a plugin cache folder uh, inside of your project. So, if I come over here to Unity, um, there's there's a plugin cache folder. So here's the asset cache folder. And this is where basically all the, the baked files go and the working files go. Over here you can see. All right. And I just really wanted to point that out because when you when you start working with it, you know, these assets here, uh, and you start baking prefabs, if you if you actually end up baking stuff, um, they all go here first. And then you, from here you can go and move them around as you see fit. Okay. So that's, that is that. All right, so let's go on to the next slide here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about digital assets. Let's get a better understanding about what this process is like. What's the workflow inside of Houdini and uh, Unity with the Houdini engine? So I'm going to play this video guy for you guys uh, so you can get a better idea. The core of the Houdini engine workflow starts with the digital asset here. And a digital asset is a collection of nodes that basically assembles our procedural content here. Basically what it does is we start with a bunch of primitives. Here we have a grid. We apply some expressions to it, uh, a little bit of noise, do some grouping, and basically just run it through a bunch of procedures to end up with our final look. So you basically go through and compose all these nodes together to develop your procedural assets. So the, the end result is a component here, or what we like to call the digital asset, that allows you to go and change your content. And this digital asset can be imported into Unity so that we actually have that power inside of the engine so we don't have to flip back and forth between our DCC content packages. So once you're done here, we flip over back to Unity, we import the HDA, and here we have the same result. We can go and change the parameters on this guy, and it all updates appropriately, like so. And you, all you need to do is just go and drag out another HDA if you want another version, just like any other game object. But this is a game object that has a bunch of parameters, so we can provide it a different type of mesh. It doesn't have to be an oil barrel. It can be some other type of mesh. I'm just going to add another oil barrel here and do a transform override. There we go. Well, now we have another set of barrels that we can place somewhere else in our levels. And it always stays active and procedural until you hit the bake prefab. So once you hit the bake prefab, you then get a prefab that you can use over and over again. So we set that here. Just drag this out. And there we go. So now we have a clean prefab that is just the geometry. Very cool. Alright, so that is the digital asset, and it really is the start of the whole workflow. It really is the core component to everything that uh, builds up your procedural content with the Houdini engine for Unity 2017. All right, very cool. So that hopefully gives you a better idea about uh, the process. I know it's you know relatively brief, but you know we go and create the the digital assets inside of uh, Houdini, and we really just start to connect all the nodes together uh, to create procedures that then output you know something like a stack of barrels, right? Or 
like the guard tower or the the wood wall or the sandbags or the ground. Even the ground here is a procedural or digital asset, so I can change the noise on it or the size or the resolution, uh, stuff like that. So hopefully that helped um, give you a little bit more insight. So uh, what's the workflow uh, like inside of Unity now with uh, Houdini Engine 2.0? All right, so I'm going to jump back over here into Unity over here, and let's take a look um, here first. And let's see what the first, what was the first topic? Oh, so we have the recook and the reload. So that's a little different now. So um, let me drag out. Let's start at the beginning here. So I'm going to go to the guard tower here and pull out uh, an asset, the, the oil barrel asset over here. And what I want to do is assign a barrel. But the, the process here is once you're done with your digital asset, you import it into Unity here. And obviously, you have to make sure you have the Houdini engine uh, installed. All right. Um, once you do that, you can start importing the HDAs. And then all you need to do is just literally drag it into the hierarchy here. And now you have a, a procedural asset. So what I can do now is I can provide this uh, an object. Right. So if I come in here and actually give it the barrel, and it doesn't need to be the barrel. You can do anything, any object. It's, it'll take anything and, and try to stack them uh, together. I just don't have any other assets here <laughs> that I can use. Um, so the, the oil barrel um, is now stacked. And you can see I can go and change this however I need. So I can come in here and make it bigger. I can bring this down to something like 2 by 2 if you want just a single. There we go. All right. We'll do 3 by 3 There you go. So you can imagine the amount of things that you can actually do with this. Instead of having to come in here and just constantly drag and drop out you know, prefabs inside of the scene, we can go and drop these digital assets and create a bunch of different variations of these stacked oil barrels. Okay? So that's that basic process. So um, anytime that you go and make a change to any of these digital assets, you overwrite this particular asset because you made a change inside of Houdini, you can come in here and you can either reload the asset or you re you can recook it. So if I reload it, it's going to completely reset everything. So you can see that the oil barrel got removed, and that's just because it completely reset the whole asset in here, and it removed the input mesh that I gave it. So let's just re-add it here. I'm going to do the barrel. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So if you don't need to necessarily reload it completely, um, I would then opt for using the recook asset. Recook will just update the parameters over here and push it into the actual digital asset. So if we just hit recook, you can see that I kept the oil barrel this time. It didn't remove any of this. It didn't reset anything in here, but it updated and looked for any changes that I might have made to this HDA. All right. So hopefully that makes sense there. Uh, let's go to the next one. So let's take a look at the structure of the or the new structure inside of Houdini uh, Engine 2.0. All right, so I'm going to go back over here. So let's take a look at this. If you if you are familiar with the Houdini Engine, you'll remember that, or you still know. I mean, because if you're still using the current version, um, that the the structure in here was quite large. Uh, and navigating it was quite difficult. And whenever you selected a particular object, it would open up or expand the hierarchy here and select one of the inside game objects that had the scripts for Houdini and, and everything like that. So this has all been changed and cleaned up, and I love it because it's a lot cleaner. It's just a lot simpler, and it makes uh, a lot more sense. So what we have here is the root object here. Okay, And this root object is where the... Houdini asset root script goes. And this contains all of the parameters and the different types of tools that you can perform on this particular digital asset. So like reloading, recooking, just keep only the output. So just give me just the geometry and get rid of everything else. Or bake the game object or make a prefab out of it. Um, and the events, which I don't really use that often yet. I'm sure I'll get into it here pretty soon. Uh, you have all the asset options. All right, just like before. Uh, and then out we have all of our parameters, just like before. But the, the editor has been cleaned up. It's way more pretty. I love it. It's super awesome. All right, so that's the root. And then we have this HDA data game object. And this data game object contains this 
Houdini Assets script. And this basically is the definition or the, um, yeah, no, the definition, that's a good word. We'll stick with that. It's the definition of the entire asset. Uh, and it's good really for just debugging or just seeing what's going on inside of the actual asset itself. Um, I wouldn't go through and actually change any of these material, these parameters um, because you really just want to stick with this root object and just change things here. This is really just taking care of stuff in the background. So, But it's good to know that this is there and if anything goes wrong, you can always come in here and, and debug stuff or maybe you know someone did actually mess with something um, and it screwed up the digital asset. It's most likely um, something that was changed in here and not at the root level. So that's what the HDA game object is. It just houses the this controller script, really. All right, and then below there, um, it's just a bunch of nodes that are housing the copied geometry. And then finally, we have you know all the other actual geometry that's being created. All right, so you can see I can click through each one of these individual barrels that were copied. Okay, so that's the basic structure now of a digital asset inside of the Houdini engine. Way cleaner. I love the new UI, much better. So there's that. All right, so let's move on. So baking and updating. All right, so one of the really cool things that we have here, we, we had baking before, it, but it's a lot better. So you can you have two options here. Um, you also have this new uh, bake update. All right, which I'm not gonna really cover it here in this uh, talk because I'm kind of kind of running out of time and I do have some more stuff to get through. But what we can do is we can now select the object and just say a baked game object. And what happens is now we have just a regular game object uh, for everything. So it removes all the Houdini engine stuff. So I know I, I, in the past I've wanted to do that where it just uh, removes all the actual scripts. And I just want the geometry and maybe the you know collision meshes and stuff like that. Um, so now that's what that button does. And then we have a bake to prefab. And now this is where the cache folder comes into play. So if I were to hit bake prefab, what's going to happen is it's going to put it into that cache folder, that baked folder. All right. And so now if I were to drag this out, I have a nice prefab. Again, all the Houdini engine stuff has been stripped out. And now it's just a everyday game object that we're all used to. All right, so that's baking and stuff like that. That's how that's, that's changed. Uh, materials are pretty much the same. So inside of Houdini, uh, you can do a create attribute node and assign the Unity material attribute to it and then give it the path to the material. So it's basically the same as it, it currently is in the official build. Uh, there's not much that really needs to be changed. But one thing I should mention is that the game developer tools for Houdini now has a, a really tiny node that just goes and allows you to set up the Unity material. So it's just faster instead of, you know, creating your own create attribute node and then, you know, writing out the attribute name and then doing all the path assignment stuff. So, all right, so moving on. So let's talk about the instancing feature inside of the Houdini engine. So what is the instancing and how does it work? Stuff like that. So instancing in and of itself makes your geometry lighter. Um, it's, it's also less resource intensive for things like the GPU when it's trying to render everything because what it's doing is it's just making a copy off of one actual object. So a really good visual representation is on the side effects uh, help for Houdini. So trying to understand pack primitives here, uh, what it does is it takes an original version of the mesh and basically locks it up, right? And it, it just references you know, the geometry that is inside of that pack primitive. And rather than making just full on copies of all that, which takes up more memory, all right, what it does is it references that back to that same original piece of geometry and saves quite a bit of memory. And so really at, at the core of it, that's what the pack primitives is. And there are a couple of example assets that come with the Houdini engine that you can check out and uh, it'll help you get started with pack primitives. It's relatively easy to set up, um, but the concept is that it just saves you memory uh, when creating these particular types of procedural geometries inside of uh, Unity, because you can imagine that, let's say for instance, you know, something like this, if I were to type in, you know, 10 by 10, 
for this. We're going to have a ton of barrels. And if they were, weren't were instanced or packed or anything like that, um, it would take quite a lot of time to generate all these particular barrels here. So by leveraging the instancing and the uh, pack primitives inside of the Houdini engine or inside of Houdini, the Houdini engine really just kind of reads it if you set it up inside of Houdini and then um, it adheres to those rules, to those procedures. Uh, instancing is awesome because uh, inside of Unity here, when you go and create an object like these barrels here, uh, what it'll do if you have instancing on, it'll actually set the instancing parameter on a material. So uh, let's go and you know get into one of the materials here. <clears throat> so what it'll do is it'll turn on the GPU instancing for you automatically. So in this case, it doesn't look like I actually set it up, but what it'll do is it'll automatically set this to an instanced object. So it'll share all the geometry and just make it lighter overall for the GPU to render it uh, to screen. Okay, and that's really the, the core of it. Um, the example assets, obviously I don't have enough time here to walk through how to do that. It's not really a tutorial type of set, setting here. Um, but there's a lot of example assets that come with the Houdini engine that will we'll show you how to set all that stuff up. All right, so moving on, let's go and... So Houdini engine inputs, we already kind of saw uh, this with the oil barrels again. I know I'm using the oil barrels quite often here, um, and I, I should just drag out some other assets so you guys can get an idea of it. Um, but when we went and added our own custom mesh to this, we were using the Houdini engine input. And there's two types of inputs that you can accept with the Houdini engine here. We have the Unity Mesh and the HDA. Now, the Unity Mesh is just your everyday generic game object, you know, some sort of static object that you imported as an FBX here inside of Unity, and then you just assign it here. If it's an HDA, that's just another digital asset. So if we take another digital asset and provide this uh, to the input here, what it'll do is it'll process all the information that's in that HDA. So it'll it'll take all the attributes and the material IDs and the assignments and stuff like that, and it'll pass it through to this particular um, digital asset so you can use them. So you can start to chain together your digital assets to create even more complex procedural assets. And I did that with the guard tower here. So the guard tower uh, itself um, here, if we select just the tower house, what it's doing is it's taking in the guard tower. So I have two components here. Let's rebuild it here so you guys can see it really quick. And I'm going to try to make it quick. I know I'm running out of time here. So let's just rebuild this guy here really quick. So I'm going to go to Guard Tower HDA. And what I want to do is just first drag out a tower object, like so. And I'm going to place it over here. And let's just play around with some of the parameters so I can adjust the height of this guy. Oh, I just need to turn this off here, like so. There we go just make it easier for us to see. So I can change the height of this guy here. And you'll notice that all the collision meshes are being adjusted. All the UVs are being created for this. I'm even baking uh, ambient occlusion into the vertices with this particular mesh. So everything's being generated. I mean, everything here is being generated procedurally. I'm not using any sort of static meshes to build the wood planks. All the, the posts and the wood planks are built procedurally as well. Uh, and then we have the bottom offset. So I can move the guys from the bottom there. And we have the top offset. Right, because why just do the bottom? And then you can change the amount of those guys. I'm going to make this really tall. There you go. So now we have an even taller tower. So we'll just leave that like that. And then I'm going to drag out a guard tower house. Now the tower house is the top piece. And this particular asset is going to take an HDA. So I'm going to switch it over to HDA. So unlike the barrel, which is taking just a Unity mesh, I'm going to provide this the guard tower HDA. And when this is all good to go, it's going to think about it. So it's processing all the information there. Now we have a new guard tower here. So let's just hide this guy. So now I have a fully built guard tower over here that's even taller. And you can see now with this particular asset, what it did is it actually went and assigned textures and materials to it. And the cool thing about this particular asset is it takes both HDA and a Unity mesh. So I can provide this a sandbag. Oops, I just need assets actually. 
So we'll do that. And you can see it went and it placed sandbags on the top. So this particular asset is utilizing both the inputs an HDA, so the bottom portion, and a Unity Mesh. So a lot of flexibility in all of that. And so right off the bat, I now have two versions of this guard tower and it only took me a minute or two to set up and I can go to the tower and change the height to something like five. Let's say it's too tall. I didn't like that, you know, so I just make it smaller segments. I want five. I'll change all that. So super powerful, um, very useful. And when you're done, just bake it out to a prefab and there you go. So now you have another version of a tower or you can keep it um, like this. Cool thing about uh, the Houdini engine now in version two um, is that all of these particular scripts and stuff like that that are attached to these components, so this HDA data, this Houdini asset script, and this root script right here are all stripped out. They're all set to editor only um, in the editor here inside of Unity. So you can actually keep all this stuff live even in your final build because when you go to make your build, it'll strip out all these particular assets. And really, the, at the end of the day, it just becomes a static piece of geometry. Right? And that's when you start to take advantage of instancing so that all your meshes are instanced as well. So uh, you can have more performant levels and stuff like that. All right. So that is pretty much that. Let's go back. Let's see what we got left here. So those are inputs. Uh, we also have the curve editor. So let's take a look at the new curve editor inside of the Houdini engine. And I'm kind of running out of space here, but we'll keep this relatively small. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here to the Houdini engine Unity, and I'm going to just say create new curve asset. And right off the bat, what it does is it gives me the new curve editor, like so. And you just hit enter to finish. And you can see that the UI has been cleaned up. Um, it's a lot easier to edit these guys now. All right. And what we can do is we can now use these in our particular uh, digital assets. So if I take something like the sandbag wall here and give it the curve object here. So I'm going to give it an HDA. So Houdini curve. And then I need to give it the mesh. So what I want to do is give it that sandbag again. because We're going to make a sandbag wall here. And there we go. We now have a sandbag wall. And of course, these all have parameters, so we can go and change the, the noise parameters and stuff like that. But I'm again, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to keep it short. Uh, all these assets are actually going to be available for free. Uh, I did record a, an, an entire course on how I made all of these assets. So um, they are available to you, so you can go and learn how to use the new version of the Houdini engine. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so that's the new curve editor. Um, we can go back and we can change a particular shape of it. So if I go to edit over here, I can just move this guy over. And what will happen is the asset itself will update. Super cool. Makes it real easy to lay stuff out really fast. And again, once you're happy with it, just you know, bake it to prefab or keep it live because uh, all this stuff gets stripped out. All right. Let's go and see what we have. All right, so obviously a lot of people know that you know learning Houdini can be you know quite a steep. There's quite a steep learning curve to it, but there really doesn't have to be. If you focus on certain areas, you don't need to get into all the effect stuff right away. Uh, you don't need to get into the compositing stuff or fluids or dynamics or anything like that. You can actually be very productive with uh, Houdini and the Houdini engine, um, literally within a day. I'd say a couple hours to a day. You know, and these are some great learning resources side effects has a ton of videos now um, up on their website so I highly recommend checking those out uh, plural site you know they're always a good go-to for these types of uh, training material um, and tagma are my some of my favorite those guys are awesome I love those guys uh, their their training is amazing it's all free and like those guys are so smart I don't even know how they got so smart anyways uh, and then obviously you can go to my YouTube channel um, I have tons of videos up there and I'm constantly updating it. So um, go and check it out. And if you have any requests, definitely drop me a line, you know, on YouTube or, or you know, sign up for IndiePix on the website or Game Tutor and just uh, shoot me an email from there. And I do my best to try to get to all of it, too. Um, so anyways, those are some great re learning resources. All right. So thanks so much for 
listening to me. I know we, we went on there for a little bit, but um, definitely let me know if you guys have any uh, questions and I'll try to come up with answers for you. All right. Thanks so much.